Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The breakthrough evidence that led to the arrest of the accused killers of college student Kristen Smart, presumed raped, murdered, and seemingly vanished. We're talking about a case that's a cold case uh, for the past 25 years. And Robert Durst's defense expert faces day two of cross-examination. Our legal analysis leading up to the highly anticipated testimony from the real estate heir himself. Is it your desire today not to testify on your own behalf? Yes, sir. The fate of an accused cop killer now in the hands of a jury. Did Stephen Wiggins knowingly shoot Sergeant Daniel Baker, then set his body on fire? Ten shots fired. Plus, a Florida sheriff's harsh words for suspects busted in an undercover sting for targeting children online. These are nasty, nasty, nasty people. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer. Terry Austin is off today. A 12 day long hearing is underway in the Kristen Smart case where a judge will determine whether there's enough evidence for a man and his father to stand trial in her death. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with what's happened so far. Anjanette. Brian Paul Flores is charged with murdering Kristen Smart. His father, Ruben, is charged with being an accessory after the fact. Kristen Smart was a 19-year-old Cal Poly student when she vanished on May 24, 1996. Investigators have said Paul Flores was walking Smart back to campus from a party and either raped or tried to rape her before killing her in his dorm room. A detective testified he interviewed Flores three days after Kristen disappeared, and he had a black eye. They've never deviated um, from, you know, this narrative that Flores is the prime suspect in this. Forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan has followed the case. Kristen Smart's mother testified at the hearing in California, saying her daughter wasn't particularly happy at Cal Poly, but had sounded more optimistic before she disappeared. Denise Smart called Kristen the best hugger and said she didn't have the financial means to leave on her own. Attorneys for Paul Flores and his father, Ruben, suggested Smart might have wanted to leave the country. There's no indication that she had done that. I think that, again, this is just a ploy on the part of the defense to raise that specter of reasonable doubt. Smart's remains have never been found. Homes owned by the Floreses have been searched, and investigators have said they believe that Smart had been buried at the home of Ruben Flores, and the remains recently moved. What's very fascinating about this case is that the police have stated that they do have physical evidence. Now, what the nature of that physical evidence is, uh, is still in question. And there's also been some testimony that Paul Flores had a nickname on campus. It was Chester the Molester, and police questioned him about that back then when Kristen Smart first disappeared. There are women who also say they've had violent sexual experiences with Paul Flores. They are also expected to testify during this hearing as well. Brian. Joining us today is Judge Susan Chris and criminal defense attorney Mike Korobonix. Judge Chris, it's a preliminary hearing, meaning we aren't talking about proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So what kind of facts would a judge be looking at to push this case forward? Well, it, it really kind of depends on what the evidentiary issues are. Are they, are the, is, is one side trying to suppress things completely, or they're trying just to subject to a motion in limine, which means you have to approach the judge first. So, I mean, as every lawyer says, it depends. It really depends, and it depends upon the facts. But you want to make sure that it's relevant, that it's, it's, it's material, it's probative, and it's not so probative that it's just prejudicial. It makes perfect sense. Now, Mike, with some of these facts, no body, a mysterious disappearance, and this physical evidence the prosecution says they have, but at least the public hasn't seen, what's the defense's strategy here? Well, it's going to be very interesting to see what the defense's strategy is. We've been seeing a, a trend more and more about these cold cases that are being tried 10, 15 years later than actually when they occurred. And these are very, very careful. And I think the prosecutors need to be more careful, quite frankly, on, than the defense right here, because you've got to watch that you don't over, overdo your evidence you're putting in to make up for the lack of evidence you may have. Absolutely. No. And Jeanette, convicted murderer Scott Peterson was brought up at one point during the hearing. How's he connected to all this? 
Well, if you ask police, they say he's not, and the prosecutors say he isn't either. Scott Peterson, of course, convicted of murdering his wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, um, Connor. He, they went missing on Christmas Eve of 2002. Peterson is currently serving um, time in prison for those two murders. He was a student at Cal Poly at the time, and there's been a lot of discussion over the years that he was at the party. Lacey Peterson also went to Cal Poly, too, um, and that he was at the party where Kristen Smart was present that night. But police and prosecutors say they have investigated that, and Scott Peterson is not involved in Kristen Smart's murder. All right, so you said the prosecution kind of moving that suspect aside. This is a preliminary hearing, one expected to last 12 days. We'll, of course, give you updates as those begin. Thank you, everyone. Turning now to more top legal news, a Florida sheriff has strong words for 17 suspects, including Disney employees, arrested in an undercover sting. The sheriff says the suspects preyed upon children online during Operation Child Protector. But much to the chagrin, instead of meeting with children, young children, they were met by law enforcement officers from the police departments as well as the sheriff's office who were online, undercover, posing as children. These are nasty, nasty, nasty people. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, a jury deliberating the fate of a man accused of shooting and killing a deputy, then lighting his body on fire. But first, inside the courtroom for the Robert Durst trial, the contentious cross-examination of the defense's expert witness continues into day two. The testimony you don't want to miss, next. Welcome back. Robert Durst's attorneys are continuing to put on their defense in the trial of the real estate heir accused of murdering his best friend, Susan Berman. Dr. Elizabeth Loftus was back on the stand for the second day of testimony on Thursday. She's a memory expert known for consulting in high-profile cases such as Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, and Ted Bundy. On direct, she suggested one of the state key witnesses could have had a false memory about the defendant allegedly confessing to the murder, saying, quote, it was her or me. I had no choice. On cross, prosecutor John Lewin tried to pick apart that assessment. How on earth could it be anything other than extremely upsetting if a close friend is now basically saying they helped cover up a murder? If, if somebody believed the speaker was a, it, it had a tendency to exaggerate or even um, be dramatic and it, it might not be upsetting. So it, what you're telling me it is... It might just be a story. Right. Uh, so what you're telling me is, is that if the person did not believe what they were told at the time, then they might have less of a memory of the event. Is that correct? Well, then they might not find it particularly upsetting. This cross-examination has been repeatedly interrupted with sidebars in the judge's chambers. The defense objected after Prosecutor Lewin asked the doctor about using qualifiers to answer the question. You asked me whether I used qualifiers in my response to Mr. Chesnoff's question, and it's my recollection that I did. Do you think you used the same or a similar amount of qualifiers with Mr. Chesnoff as you're doing with me? I, I, I don't recall the exact answers. So, doctor, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, hey, listen, you've got to get this answer right. Do you think you've used more qualifiers with Mr. Chesnoff or with me? What would you say? Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, sustained. That's just an argument. I'm, just, I'm trying to get an answer, Your Honor. Well, no, a gun to the head is a, a particularly uh, ugly metaphor, and <laughs> uh, I'm not going to allow you to insult the witness in this way. Let's bring back our special guest, Judge Susan Chris, who presided over Robert Durr's first murder trial in Texas for the death of his neighbor, Morris Black. Now, Your Honor, you've had a front row seat to Robert Durr's on the witness stand. What should we anticipate his direct to sound like in this case? You know, he was very charming um, in our case, but in the meantime, he said so many things that he has to walk back. He has to walk back on the jinx talking about deceiving the jury. And so he's going to have to have a pretty clever story to do that. But I'm sure it's going to be very rehearsed. They're going to have something. They're going to have something, and he's going to, he's going to put that forth. But I can't imagine Lewin not cross-examining him and undoing whatever they do on direct.
All right, so clever, charming, rehearsed. Thank you very much for that, Your Honor. Now, he may not be a judge, but he's honorable in my eyes. Let's bring in criminal defense attorney Mike Korobonix. Mike, after the doctor's testimony, would you be advising Durst to testify or not? I don't think his attorneys are in a position to advise him as to anything. <laughs> I think he's going to do what he wants to do. And I think what he wants to do is he wants to take the stand. And I think, quite frankly, Llewellyn, sometimes the prosecutor in this case, sometimes through other witnesses, is prepping Durst for when he's going to cross-examine him by, I think, sort of like challenging him, let him know what to expect, that he's not going to be consistent in the way he gets cross-examined. And I think this is going to be very interesting and very, very much worth the watch. Yeah. And absolutely, don't forget that a def criminal defendant has the absolute right to testify. A lawyer can only advise them. And at the end of the day, it's their choice. And I think the judge would agree he's probably going to make that choice. Now, Judge, you remember the black trial better than anyone else. When you think of the testimony in Susan Berman's trial, do you think any of the witnesses had any memory issues? I don't think a single one did when it comes to the substance of their testimony. I think the, the jinx made it possible for them to admit that they knew things, but they didn't remember because they were watching it or seeing something in the newspaper. You don't have someone tell you that they alibied for somebody during a murder or they committed. You don't forget a word of that, ever. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Mike Corbanis, what do you think about that, the way memory imprints? Do you think that this is something that someone would be like, I don't know, Mike Corbanis told me about this murder that he had years ago. I'm going to forget about it. Do you think that's realistic here? No, I don't. But I think that's the only one of the only avenues they could travel since it's such an old case. If they didn't put on a witness about memory, I think they'd be having to worry about an ineffective assistance to a counsel claim. Absolutely. So it makes sense. Maybe this is more of a strategy in that this is so long ago. People could have had uh, memory issues. They could have maybe misremembered. They could have maybe thought he said X instead of Y or Z. So maybe this is just good litigation where maybe the facts don't rest on your side, which makes a lot of sense in this, the California versus Robert Durst case. Don't forget to check it out. We've got it on Law and Crime Network for Gabble to Gabble coverage. Thank you both. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, hear from Stephen Wiggins himself, days after he's accused of shooting a sheriff's deputy in the head. His shocking admission to investigators after the break. Welcome back. We head to Tennessee where a jury has reached a verdict for the fate of a man accused of shooting a deputy and lighting his body on fire. Wiggins is charged with first degree murder, vehicular arson and abuse of a corpse for the death of Dickinson County Sheriff's Deputy Sergeant Daniel Baker. If convicted, Wiggins can face the death penalty. Baker was killed on May 28, 2018. Two days later, investigators caught Wiggins. He agreed to sit down for an interview and admitted to the shooting. Wiggins says he tried to give CPR to Baker, but when he realized Baker didn't have a pulse, he fired another round because, quote, it's like a dog. You don't let it suffer. I don't know. Just from that point on, when I realized everybody was, you know, it's like a, it's like a dog. You don't let it suffer. You make sure, you know. I went that big moment, man, to suffer. I checked his pulse and I didn't have one, and it was still a dog. You know, I didn't want him to be feeling anything, to be hurting. Just in case, I, I wouldn't want to let him suffer. The trial nearly came to a halt after prosecutors played a portion of the defendant's police interrogation when he talked about selling drugs that the judge already ruled the jury couldn't hear. The judge denied the mistrial request and the court resumed. Here's the clip. But listen to me, I, I hear you say that, but I've heard you two times I know for sure, maybe three times, but you told us the gun was way underneath the seat. When so he pulled up, but, but I see what kicked I'm it up under my seat whenever he pulled up. I okay. kicked it as hard as I could as far up under my seat. Why was it out in the first place? Because I was actually up that way to sell some dope.
When we come back, the defendant's decision on whether or not to take the stand in his own defense. Plus, closing arguments, which side will the jury believe? The verdict ahead. Back now to the trial of the accused cop killer, Stephen Wiggins. Prosecutors rested and the defense asked their client that all important question. Will he take the stand in his own defense? Mr. Wiggins, have I, along with Mr. Simmons and Mr. Hopkins, fully explained to you your right, absolute right, to testify on your own behalf in this trial? Yes, sir. Likewise, have the three of us also fully explained to you your right not to have to testify, to ever have to testify in this trial? Yes, sir. And do you understand those rights? Yes, sir. And understanding those rights and having talked about that, um, is it your desire today not to testify on your own behalf? Yes, sir. With that, the defense rested without calling any witnesses and court proceeded to closing arguments. Prosecutors say the defendant knew he was going to kill an officer if he was stopped and purposely tried to cover up the evidence. 18, Stephen Wiggins, the defendant, took the life of Dixon County Sheriff's Deputy Sergeant Daniel Baker when he murdered him by methodically shooting Sergeant Daniel Baker six times. Daniel, you good? I'm good. And the voice that you all heard on there was the defendant, Stephen Wiggins, impersonating Sergeant Daniel Baker, the officer in the floorboard or the back seat of his car. And he was acting in a law enforcement capacity, impersonating a law enforcement officer, calling in with those codes, registering those things. The defense admits Wiggins killed Baker, but says the shooting wasn't premeditated and asked the jury to consider the charge of second degree murder. We're not asking you to not hold Mr. Wiggins responsible for the killing. That's not what I'm standing here doing. And that's what we told you at the beginning of this trial. We were not here to say he didn't kill him and that Sergeant Baker is not a victim. We're asking you to consider the law. And the law requires that as angry as you may be, as biased as you may now be, that you not allow those emotions in and you'll get instructions on that. Your decision has to be done with reflection and judgment. You have to also have those emotions put to the side so that you do what's right, not what's just vengeful. On rebuttal, prosecutors reminded the jury of Sergeant Baker's last words, shots fired, officer down. Why did Sergeant Baker need to give that warning? Because the defendant was able to fool Sergeant Baker once. How did he manipulate and fool Sergeant Baker? By using his reflection and judgment. He was able to convince Sergeant Baker to stop the felony encounter, to reholster his weapon and allow the defendant to exit that vehicle through the passenger side. That takes an exercise of reflection and judgment. After just 90 minutes of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. Here's their decision. As to count one of the indictment, the charge of false report, can you tell me how does the, ver how does the jury find? Guilty, Your Honor. As to count two, Premeditated first degree murder, how does the jury find? Guilty, Your Honor. As to felony murder, uh, first degree murder, felony murder on count three, how does the jury find? Guilty, Your Honor. Judge Chris, your thoughts on the verdict, but also the speed in which the jury decided. I'm not surprised. I was expecting a guilty verdict. And the trial, I was surprised the trial was so fast. But with the evidence being what it was, the emotional, the cold-bloodedness of it, I was not surprised that they got a quick guilty. 
Yeah, the defense really tried to narrow in on an argument, and I respect them for that, especially based on the facts, going for just premeditation, but I don't think the facts reflected that argument, and I think the jury came back pretty quickly and pretty precisely in that. Now, Mike, the penalty phase begins Saturday. The defense couldn't charm the top count away because they were just asking to beat that and only that, not the other charges. Do you think there is any luck in maybe charming away the death penalty here? I think, I always think some that has a shot of doing that, and it's a possibility, because I always think there are some jurors who have strong reservations about the death penalty, even though they try to be as fair as possible. I think this defense did a very good job of really starting to charm that away for the penalty phase during the trial phase, and I think they've maintained credibility, and I think the confession is going to be a big play in the penalty phase, because this is the first time in that where the actual, there's a showing of remorse by the defendant. Absolutely. Now, real quick, let's ask Judge Chris, uh, we haven't heard the penalty phase as yet, but what do you think? Death penalty or life without the possibility of parole? What would you guess? I'm going to guess death penalty, but I, I do agree that, you know, it's one thing to say I'm for the death penalty. It's a whole other thing to issue a verdict that results in someone being executed. But I think the facts here are so strong, a death penalty is not going to surprise me. Yeah, Mike, we've seen the country kind of change a little bit over the time as to the response to the death penalty. But a case like this, what do you think? Death penalty or life without the possibility of parole? My, my feeling is they're going to come back with the death penalty based on the facts of this case. I would tend to agree as well. Of course, if it stay with Law & Crime Network to see what the result is. Thank you both. And thank you for joining us here at Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.